numbers are thrown out all the time. Are they proof of some truth or just fluff that bluffs us? These statistics, they need some serious looking into. And that's what I'll do. I'm Brendan Fernandez. We find out the story behind the statistics. Because some numbers are just worth figuring out. This is the first time I've turned up for work and I don't know what we're doing. So what's this? Uh, you gotta figure it out yourself. Okay, I don't know where this place is. Uh, I'm not sure how we're gonna get there, but I, I guess we're going to Bidadari. Lesson one. So I've been told to find Bidadari, a new town planned for Singapore in 2030. The daily commute is such a central part of the Singapore lifestyle. By 2020, the goal is to have at least 85% of commuters on public transport take 16 minutes or less when heading to work during morning rush hour. All that takes massive planning. Especially when Singapore's population could grow by as much as 1.6 million by 2030. Where do we put homes? How are people going to get around? Where do we put trees? While thinking about what my town might look like, I arrived at my destination. Very good. Ah, so, this is Bidadari. It's, uh, it took me about 10, 15 minutes to get here from Mirikop. It's right beside Upper Sarangan Road. It's, it's really green, there's lots of trees. I saw people going for walks. Other than that, there's nothing here. Bidadari measures 0 0.93 square kilometers. More than 130 football fields can fit in here. But this place is not going to be filled with footballers. Instead, it's going to become a new housing estate with 11,000 homes, private and HDB. Bidadari is not the only place seeing groundbreaking change. 700,000 new homes are planned by 2030 to meet demand. This is where they'll be. Here's a map of Singapore. The new homes will be here and here. Bukit Batok and Bukit Merah. These are older estates that can be developed. Pongol will triple in size when the northern part is fully developed. It'll have 96,000 homes. New units can also be built on unused land in current estates. Tampines North, here, near IKEA, can house 21,000 units. And then there are the new housing estates. To the west, we have Tunga, right here, Tunga, the old military training ground. Parts of the old military trading ground will make way for 55,000 homes, making it an estate almost the size of Ang Mo Kyo. But at this rate, it's still going to be a bit of a squeeze. We're going to need a bigger island. And that's in the pipeline. This is Singapore in 2030. Our little red dot has grown another 7%. From the current 715.8 square kilometers, we're going to grow to 766 square kilometers. After reclamation, Pulau Tokong in the northeast will continue to be used for military training. Tuas in the west will house infrastructure. In the 2006 film Superman Returns, Lex Luthor said of people, they'll always need more land. It's the one thing they're not making any more of. If only Luther could see us now. Singapore started at a size of 578.1 square kilometers. That's 23% less land than we have now. Back then, the strategy was to create residential areas by race. 
The Chinese, Indian, Malay, Arab, and European communities had their own residential zones. The place we now call Raffles Place was then known as Commercial Square, which soon became very congested. It was only in the 1950s that proper urban planning started. Part of the solution was the creation of new towns. When the new millennium arrived in the year 2000, Singapore had already grown by 18.1% since Stafford Raffles first got here in 1819. That's the effect of land reclamation. 15% of all land area was used for residential purposes. It dropped slightly to 14% in 2010. But by 2030, residential areas will occupy 17% of Singapore's total land area. That 17% in 2030 will include the town of Bidadari. We're looking at 11,000 homes to be built in Bidadari. How many people does that make? Well, the latest number on average household size from 2011 was 3.5 people per household. We take that number, multiply it by 11,000 homes, and we get a projected population of 38,500 people living in an area of 0.93 square kilometers in Bidadari which works out to an average of 41,397 people per square kilometer. But like any good town planner, I'll need to try to build a Bidadari where residents can enjoy high quality of life despite high density. You know, an executive maisonette sold for 1.1 million Singapore dollars in February this year in Bishan. Who would have thought that a million dollar flat could come from an area they used to bury people in? Which is exactly what Bidadari used to be. Opened in 1904, Bidadari was Singapore's third cemetery. It was supposed to be the last resting place for more than 58,000 people. But exhumation of the graves began in December 2001. Will Bidadari transform from a place for the dead to real estate that the living would die for? If I were in charge of building Bidadari, what would I do to make this space livable? As it turns out, Singapore already does well at being a livable, high-density city. A livability matrix diagram was put out last year. It outlines how major cities handle the stresses and opportunities when millions of people cluster together. Livability was measured using what we call the Quality of Living Survey, done by Mercer, a consulting firm on global human resource and financial services. There are two parts to this survey living conditions, which includes your housing and natural environment, and the city's infrastructure, which includes your electricity and water supply. Now we know how the results are derived. Here's how the countries perform. Lowest livability here, highest livability here. And over here, we have the population density number of people per square kilometer. At the bottom, we have a lot more elbow room, low population density. At the top, a tighter squeeze, high population density. Let's have a look at some of the world's major cities. You have here cities that are crowded. They also scored low on livability. You have Lagos in Nigeria, Dhaka in Bangladesh, and Moscow in Russia. At the other end of the spectrum, you have cities that offer a high level of livability, along with that precious premium, space. You have Vancouver and Sydney here, and also some surprises, New York and Tokyo, in the low population density region. How did that happen? Now here, 
are those few cities which have managed to balance high population density with livability. London, Hong Kong. And where's our little red dot? Singapore. Over here. Scoring very high on livability despite a population density of over 7,000 per square kilometer. Standing out from the rest, Singapore is an outlier. Dr. He, how does Singapore manage to uh, balance high population density with high livability? One of the principles would be to bring nature closer to people. Okay. And what we've done is like in the case of the Kalang Amokyo Bishan Park, mm -hmm. um, a concrete canal has been converted into a park where people can actually get very close to the water. Right. Another principle that um, has been used quite widely is um, what we call uh, creating variety uh, and to create uh, relief for density. So in Topayo New Town, yeah. um, it's been designed like a checkerboard where tall buildings of 25, 40 storeys, you know, the residential buildings right. are actually interspersed with uh, neighbourhood buildings like school buildings, public parks, uh, commercial buildings, so that the actual perception of density when you're in a space is not one that is actually, you know, cramped by tall buildings, but you actually see open space um, around you. But wait a minute, I found out this Mercer Quality of Living survey was conducted for one reason to calculate the amount of allowance expatriates should be given when posted to those cities. Now that puts a very different spin on things. So when the study looked at Singapore's performance as a densely populated but highly livable city, they were really looking at the expat-centric side of things. Take schools, for example. International schools were focused on, not public schools. In housing, the study paid attention to the rental market, so public housing was not the focal point. So does our great quality of life actually benefit Singaporeans like you and me? Well, one of the components, and uh, this is actually a quite large component in the Mercer's uh, quality of living in index is actually uh, the provision of city infrastructure and in that area Singapore scores very well in that sense uh, although this the intention of the index was for expense uh, it would apply quite well to uh, how Singaporeans would perceive the quality of living it's not so cut and dry as I don't think so right, okay. right we've done well so far but bigger challenges lie ahead there's one thing which strongly affects our sense of whether we are crammed too tightly together with our neighbours. That is the size of our homes. There are about 1.2 million homes in Singapore. Of that, 0.9 million are HDB flats. Which means more than 82% of Singapore residents live in HDB flats. Three in ten of those live in a four-room flat the most popular type of flat in Singapore. But there is the perception that this older four-room flat is very different from this newer four-room flat. The issue is size, and the perception is that flats have been getting smaller and smaller over the years. In 2012, National Development Minister Kor Boon Wan said that HDB has not shrunk the size of its flats in the last 15 years. For example, four-room flats have stayed more or less the same size. A four-room flat built in the 1960s was about 73 square meters in size. But if you bought a four-room flat in the 70s, in any of the new towns springing up at the time, you would get about 10 more square meters. The flat would be about 83 square meters in size. Still in the 70s, if you got a four-room NG, which stands for a four-room new generation, then you got 92 square meters. It came with a really big kitchen. Now in the 80s, your four-room flat would have been just about as big as they get, about 105 square meters. Let's go to the 90s. That was the busiest decade for HDB. 
They were building 25,000 to 35,000 units every year. Flats were about 100 square meters in size. In 1997, HDB decided to standardize the size of four-room flats. Any flat built from that point on would be pegged at 90 square meters. And any four-room flats built today remain at around 90 square meters in size. Compare these two flats, one built before 1997 and one after. The new flats are about 10% smaller, but certain design elements might also have made the new flat look smaller than it actually is. In the flat built after 1997, the kitchen seems smaller because the dining and laundry areas are sectioned off from the main kitchen. In the past, the dining area was also part of the kitchen, so the kitchen seemed bigger. So, to a certain degree, it's home, sweet, smaller home. But what about the surroundings outside the home? The greenery, which can make a densely populated environment so much more livable. Is that shrinking too? Singapore, the Garden City. Flora has always been our shield against the encroaching concrete jungle. In fact, while researching this episode, we found out that Singapore has green cover of more than 40%. More than 40% green cover? Really? For a population our size? Do we really have that many parks and forests? I brought my questions to conservation activist, Dr. Ho Hua Chiu. Green cover just means uh, vegetation. How do this is uh, manage green cover? Manage green cover. This means uh, it includes things like uh, uh, golf courses, ah. football fields, okay. and then you have what they call spontaneous greenery. And uh, this includes the nature reserve, okay. the four nature reserves. And uh, includes uh, secondary forests outside the nature reserve, uh, swamp forests, mangrove, and scrubland. So that's what green cover means. Areas that appear green on satellite imagery. So all that green you see, that's our green cover. That includes the 1.4 million trees planted by the National Parks Board. This tree canopy counts towards that green cover. In addition to providing shade, a mature tree can provide enough oxygen in a year for about four people. But according to Dr. Ho, the increase in green cover is also a result of all the reclaimed land that's left to fallow, or when farming areas or cemeteries are cleared, because spontaneous greenery takes over. Unfortunately, this spontaneous greenery is usually not protected from future development. Over here in Bidadari, 70 to 80 percent of the area is slated for clearing to build housing. There are plans for a new park to be built here, but for Dr. Ho, that may not necessarily be good. The park here, although it's going to be planted with some trees here and there, the trees will be very thin, scattered, you know. So the density of the forest is gone. This has to do with the leaf area in index the density of the, of the leafage. And you find this more in natural greenery, like woodland, for example. Mm -hmm. Massive uh, greenery around, provided by the leaves, right. right? proliferation of leaves and all that, you see? So this helped to keep the ambient temperature cool. So while the definition of green cover isn't what I imagined it to be, Singapore still has a significant 10% of its land set aside for green spaces like this. In 1963, government efforts to green Singapore took root with a mumpat tree planted by then Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew. When our then Prime Minister started this greening initiative or greening program, right. um, I think he had the vision and the foresight of how greenery can actually attract foreign investors. I see. Okay. How greenery can um, actually differentiate us, distinguish us 
from the rest of the other cities in the world. Whenever uh, a visitor steps into Singapore from the Changi Airport, the first thing when they see uh, these uh, neatly uh, lined rows of trees along the roads, uh, one would be able to uh, see how well organized this place is and therefore it will uh, attract the kind of uh, confidence that you have of the place. Currently, if you look at the map, about 10% of the land area in Singapore comes under green spaces. That includes our parks and nature reserves. At the heart of the island, you can find our green lung, the central catchment area. At 28.89 square kilometers, the central catchment area is our biggest nature reserve. And it has retained its size over the years. Our main reservoirs, MacRitchie, Upper Salita, Upper and Lower Pierce, are all here. The green formula goes roughly like this. Every thousand residents can enjoy 0.8 hectares of park space. That's an area slightly bigger than a football field. Come 2030, the plan is to have even more parks, not fewer. By then, it'll be easy for 85% of all residents to enjoy a stroll in the park because they'll probably find one less than 400 meters away. So this is what our green map will look like. This is our city in a garden. How have our greening efforts changed over the years? We started off by just merely planting as many trees as possible. So just planting trees? Yes, okay. uh, you know, just to green up the place, right. just to give us more shape, more right. greenery. Uh, but that evolved into something uh, of a, more of a garden city, right. right? adding on more colours and all that. Now we are going into the next phase, uh, where we want to uh, go into uh, being a city in a garden, where uh, there's pervasive greenery. You are actually living within a garden, a place that is a livable place for us to live, work and play in. It's likely that Bidadari takes his name from a Sanskrit word meaning divine messenger or angel. So if I were to build my own Bidadari, I'd be building my little slice of heaven right here on earth. So this is Bidadari. It'll be densely populated but very livable. Flats will be around the same size as they are now. There'll be parks, park connectors and waterways. These will be the focal points of the community. They'll need cycling paths gardens that crown our flats. But what I'm really hoping is that a lot of this original greenery can stay. So this is my idea of what Bidadari could look like. The Housing Development Board plan said the aim was to create a distinctive and sustainable tranquil urban oasis. It would seem that the sustainable tranquil and oasis parts are already here. We just have to find a way to make sure that they stay.